Hello and welcome to Dune, a lock-in at the Crate and Crowbar. That's right, tonight, uh, on the 4th of November 2021, uh, we are here to discuss Frank Herbert's Dune, Denise Villeneuve's Dune, dry, hot, arakeen summer hit. And my name is Chris <laughs> <laughs> And tonight I'm joined by Marsh Davies. Hello. And Tom Senior. Hello. Uh, big Dune fans all, I think. And tonight uh, we are here to stuff our hands into the already very full hot take gomja bar and, <laughs> and extract our uh, humanity through the medium of having opinions about a film. Uh, before we kick off with that, however, obviously there's a bunch of things we could do in terms of offering some maybe some spoiler-free opinions or some summaries or whatever, because I imagine the rest of this podcast is likely to be quite spoilery, and that's your first warning of probably several. But before we begin, I have a question for both of you. Um, in your mind, what does spice taste like? Mm, that's such mm. a good question. I instantly know the answer. Uh, and mm, I think is... everyone does. Yeah, uh, it's, I it's... know the taste. I don't know if I can describe it. It's um, it's chip spice that you can get in some parts of the north of England. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> it it really is though. It's a salty but also savoury, like a kind of mix mm. of bisto and some undisclosed herbal essence. I'm not sure what Fucking it is. It's got it like a yeah. It's like a I peri rub. I thought it was mysterious, but you have just explained it. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! Yeah. So I, I was very confident in this as well. I had the same confidence that you do, Tom, that it was a very, mm. that's very specific. Like occasionally, like, you know, when you get crisps and they'd have a sachet in them exactly. um, of like, of like exactly. flavor salt, that's pretty much that, mm. but um, it gives you ruinous prophecies that, um, mm. um, however, there's a bit in the film, not to skip ahead, <clears throat> where Paul Atreides is exposed to a spice bed for the first time. And I didn't pick it up the first time I saw the film, but the second time I saw the film, I picked up on the fact that in the soundtrack, there is this, there's this sound that sounds exactly like how popping candy sounds when it's in your mouth, like uh, when it's up at the back of your palate, yeah. like opening your tonsils and it starts to like, you know, that thing it does where it starts to like hammer its way to your brain. Um, and, and I was yeah. like, oh, that's, that's, that's a different. So I think, I think, I don't think it changes the savory nature. Um, of or the, the meaty nature of, of savory spice but i think um i think it has also gained that quality for me since watching the film and that maybe awesome. illustrates a meaningful way in which the film has augmented my understanding of this world that's also that's um that lovely kind of uh, we'll get into the film properly in broader ways but let's let's really get into this <laughs> depiction of spice oh, yeah. is it, is this glittering floating particulate that the uh, the kind of lens uh, like close lens effect that you get when spice is sort of happening to someone mm -hmm. namely paul all the time uh, also kind of combines with that popping kind of sizzling sense to be like oh mm. it is it's a delicious experience it's like yeah yeah i would like to huff that melange I would. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there's a part of this where Denis Villeneuve has obviously made a, a very technically impressive, uh, certainly very visually impressive film. And there's other where he's made like probably the optimal, he's, he's determined the optimal like Instagram language for crisps. <laughs> <laughs> Which one was his true purpose? We'll have to I don't know. interview him. Well, hey, it's not like the film people... is immune. It's not like the film is immune to slightly weird or kind of off tone product crossover right with the, they've got these characters in fortnite um you know you can you can do the sand walk in fortnite now so i really am not i'm not opposed to like bring out bring out like walkers melange you know what i mean <laughs> like sand walkers right it's all right there like, it's all right there oh it's like a <laughs> it's like a pringles tube but it looks like a sandworm and <laughs> and then when you're done with it it's a little thumper for the kids Ah, incredible! It's quite, quite a good film, isn't it? As well, I think. Yeah, we should get. I, I mean, good. let's. Yeah, let's, let's skip ahead. Um, <laughs> so yeah, well, <laughs> um, we can return to the subject of what what spice tastes like and why is it crisps um, in a minute. But yeah, we should talk about the film. So obviously, in this podcast, we're going to kind of unpack the whole thing in whatever direction we end up unpacking it. Um, uh, but as we did with the Green Knight, let's let's talk a little bit about. Um, what the film is and whether we would recommend 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 it, I suppose, before we get into the really um, spoilery stuff. Um, Tom, you've got a good grasp of what Dune is. Do you want to give us the the quick version? 
So it is the story of an adolescent kind of uh, being forced into a, a, a destiny that he isn't ready for that may also make him a monster ultimately and that's the kind of core kind of arc not arc, I mean, the kind of core proposition for the character that you're following paul adrades uh, and he this takes place in uh, a universe ruled by a vast empire that uses uh a time, mind, and space-altering drug to travel vast distances, and that's how the empire exists. The entire empire relies, uh, in its entire infrastructure relies on this spice that can only be mined from one place, uh, a planet called Arrakis, which is a shithole. Um, but it's a shithole that must be occupied, and occupied by the worst people in the universe, <laughs> often, and who take it, you know, through the sheer weight of imperialism and politics, have uh, turned this... Uh, this place into an, a, a relentless war zone that century by century changes hands according to often the whims of an emperor uh, who goes largely unseen as kind of this guiding force and uh, also at the whims of uh, a, an, an order called the Bene Gesserit who is a kind of pseudo-religious but also kind of uh, a political force that uh, often manipulates the emperor etc. So lots of politics um, but f ultimately the story of a child being thrust into this um, in a position of responsibility that he's not at all ready for. Uh, and I kind of won't say more than that without kind of getting into the kind of interesting dynamics of uh, how destiny works in June as a book and as a film. Indeed. Is that, yeah. Is and that it? Yeah. That, that's a good was, yeah. pot summary. Yeah. And so, and obviously the novel Dune is, is one of those foundational sci-fi texts now and enormously influential in its own right on everything from like star wars to game of thrones in in really big ways um <clears throat> and uh long had a kind of you know troubled history of adaptation um so obviously the, the david lynch movie in the 80s the sci-fi miniseries in the early noughties um and so this sort of um like big effort by daniel villeneuve this is the first part of i think now confirmed to be at least two just to adapt the first book um it's probably the most kind of um it feels like the first sort of um really robust and appropriately budgeted attempt to adapt a novel whose scope is so large yeah. and that is the source of a lot of its successes and i would say some of its failures as well um, um and obviously denis Villeneuve comes to this from blade runner 2049 blade runner sequel um and a history of doing really interesting things in in, in sci-fi very visually in cinema generally um and yeah marsh what would you what would you would you recommend the film having seen it like what was your kind of top level take for sure I, I mean absolutely recommend it i would say this is the best dune film that we're going to get out of the hollywood system <laughs> yeah. and that is i i think you can hint you can tell that there is there is a caveat there <laughs> to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, how how good an, an adaptation i think this is how how good a film in general it is um, I did. Uh, I did certainly enjoy myself a lot watching it, um, but I, I I watched it twice, and the, the second time uh, I found it less rewarding. I think I find this true of a lot of Villeneuve's films uh, in general, which are always incredibly lush spectacles. Uh, they're beautifully, beautifully shot, um, uh, brilliant product design <laughs> in, in it, um, and they're full of symbology. You know, every, every mm. shot has kind of imbued with visual meaning. But I always find them slightly unsatisfying it, that there's a sort of a, a want of substance beneath that, that symbology. I feel like that symbolism needs to be backed up by dialogue, um, sp spoken more as people speak it, is, is, is my desire for these films. Like, whereas I feel like, you know, if, if Villeneuve can get away with a scene in which, you know, Amy Adams just looks troubled in the half light of dawn, then he will, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> mm -hmm. and unfortunately the principal form of human communication is, is not forlornly looking at the horizon. It is, it's people talking and, um, uh, what, like, I, it makes me sound like I want his film to be like Mike Lee kitchen sink dramas. And I don't, I don't mean that I, I do, but I do I always yearn for something slightly more at the level of characters' dialogue from Villeneuve's mm. films. Um, and I think 
this film is probably one of his his better in that regard because I think uh, Dune is such a talky book that even though he cuts down that dialogue to incredibly terse levels, there is still enough substance there that these characters do sometimes feel like characters rather than ciphers. But I do think in general that terseness can sometimes pare away whatever profundity was in the text and just reduce things to symbols rather than human action or dialogue. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I don't, like not to skip ahead, but I think there is something actually very uh, how, to, how to describe it? monotextural about the the style of doing a lot of Vilna stuff, where uh, the, the kind of cadence and the the slow panning over landscapes and the slow kind of interactions and the endlessly present soundtrack of, can veer into be, being kind of ponderous in a way that sometimes I kind of want it all to shut up <laughs> while something mm -hmm. exciting is happening. Um, and actually being in a constant state of flow, I kind of don't really gel with the Christopher Nolan thing of the soundtrack always being with you all the time, undulating mm. and rising and crescendoing and then going down, but always buzzing in your ear. I don't actually like that. I think sometimes just having silence and stuff quickly happening in sudden violent outbursts that don't have um, the Hollywood framing as, say, a last stand in a corridor, which is one scene that I, didn't, I thought was very undune. Uh, um, I think like it, it's, I, it does let it down. And also it, because there are some really, really fascinating character points in, in June and the sort of mm. tragedy of the Atreides um, and the relationship between Paul and Jessica, particularly, I think is, is one of the most under kind of played tensions in the original book in that essentially the mother is trying to push her son into this existence and when it starts to happen she becomes terrified of him because what he's becoming should be terrifying to any living being um and that that's the kind of that's the that's the underlying thing that june is about that that's the terror that goes underneath everything the quizats hadrach which has become uh kind of a bit of a punchline because of the way it was delivered in uh lynch's film uh, for he is the Quetzal Tadrak, um, but actually that should be that's uh, should be like a doom laden pronouncement for humanity and the universe and everything, and uh, her relationship with her son and them both being entwined in this way. She, it, like that, imagine if the film dug into that <laughs> as much as it dug right. into big, slow, cool. Here's Charney uh, <laughs> turning around. Just really, um, she'll she'll get there. She'll turn around eventually. But no, then, oh, he, 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 I don't know. I, I've jumped ahead a bit, but, you know, I think there are some... Well, I think uh, in terms of bringing it back to it, like, takes on the film as a tool, I, had to, I totally hear what you're saying, because I had the opposite experience to March. I've also seen it twice. Um, I, I actually bounced off it quite hard the first time. I had a better time with it the second time. Hmm. Um, and one of the reasons for that was, I think the first time I watched it, I couldn't not watch it as an adaptation, like, to try and sound out what it's doing or what it's not doing. Hmm. And I think what you've identified, Tom, is really spot on, which is... It strikes me that like there's two sides to there's well, there's many sides to Dune the novel. But the two that I think any adaptation are going to collide with are going to be um Dune as a as you say, very talky book about uh, that's very very intensely about the interiority of one particular character, Paul, but also about all of the characters in it. Um, you know, the it's a it's a you know, a world of micro gestures and poison sniffers and this constant sense of sort of uh, visible, invisible things, whether they're feelings or threats that are kind of laden in, in the atmosphere itself. Um, and that has a relationship with the internal lives of the characters and how they navigate it. And that kind of culminates in what Paul's subsequently able to do. And then on the other side is the kind of the broader, uh, the ideas of the film, the broader kind the, broad, the ideas of the novel, it's, it's, it's um, philosophical ambitions. You know, it's been described as philosophical fiction as well as science fiction. And I think that's appropriate. It's relationship with, faith in the future its relationship with politics um you know there's a there's a ton to say about that but either way either way you, you take dune <clears throat> you're going to collide with one or both of these things and i think my initial impression of it was almost like being surprised and a little bit disappointed that the movie apparently had managed to thread this almost impossible middle course through <laughs> by doing neither of them <laughs> like you know what i mean um because so you know for and, and i i really dwelled on this for a while that like um and I, i'd like to get into more detail of it so maybe this is the point where we start to step off into just talking about the movie um but initially but I'll, I'll, I'll explain where i came back around to that and then maybe return to it like you know that it neither i think really articulated or unpacked the novel's ideas and i think in some cases 
um, particularly in terms of the really very, uh, very visible and very sort of apparent um, themes of um, colonialism, oppression, race and faith that are in the book um, that I thought were actually far more reductively presented in the film than they are in the novel, um, despite the intervening 50 years. I think um, it's kicked the can for that completely down the road to the sequel. Really, I mean, right. all of the, all of that stuff will have, have to come home to roost in however this story concludes, and it really doesn't. I mean, it, it so it's, it's a, obviously aware of that stuff. It's clearly mindful of like racial coding and all these other things, but then it doesn't actually get around to saying anything about it. I don't think in this. I want to. I, well, I want to go back into that point a bit deeper because I think it's actually its mindfulness is in mm. some ways creates problems. Um, that the book doesn't have. Um, the book has different problems, and um, but we get back. But but also like on the other side, it doesn't really give you very much access to, you know, the internal lives of the characters and so on. And my first my impression coming out of the film for the first time was that I just spent like three hours with a incredible like coffee table art book of a book I love, right? And if I didn't know what the what the in, what the significance of the sequence of events was. It would just be pretty. Um, And then the second time, which was yesterday, I went to see it again. And I had to kind of, you know, I was sort of like uh, one of those things where I wasn't sure if I was going to see it. And then I just sort of, because I'm a week off work this week. And I just sat down and said, and I was actually quite transported by it. And I enjoyed it, I think, more on its own terms. Because the, the first time I saw it, I couldn't believe that it would be a successful way into that world for people who didn't know the novel. And then all I had seen in the week subsequently on Twitter was people kind of falling in love with it. And I think having seen it again, um, I can kind of understand why. I think I think it is a really sort of hypnotic, compelling thing. Mm-hmm. I think it's running time um, goes quite quickly, and the the little um, and the moments where I think the filmmaking really works is where things that would be certainly said and then probably unpacked in the novel can pass with a look. Mm. Um, and there were things that almost frustrated me the first time I saw it, like lines that you almost lose under like the roar of ornithopter engines. And and like, I think I'm like, you mentioned like, I'm almost desperate for any line to be fully heard because <laughs> it might be the only thing anyone's going to say for a minute um, <laughs> that actually now kind of worked for me because they feel like things that are there to kind of um, discover. And I think this is like the real, like um, um, uh, the, the, the tricky thing with Denis Villeneuve's films is like, um, and it's it's like it's, and and you're right to call out Nolan as well because I suppose it's the same issue of like mm. was this was this deep or was it loud? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I I genuinely think that's that is Nolan's aesthetic. Like I I think he consciously constructs films which aren't actually that intellectually challenging, but wraps them up in in sort of like bauble gaudy entertainments which are so superficially kind of exciting that you forget that what's being dealt with underneath is actually quite shallow and that's fine because that gives you that the in the moment sensation and excitement in the cinema and it doesn't make the the thing ultimately impenetrable you can still keep up with uh you know inception uh but you feel like it's it's you know teasing you in a really kind of intellectually exciting way in that moment um, but then yeah. they kind of fall apart afterwards. I think if you if you scrutinise them, but they, I don't think they're there to be scrutinised in Nolan's case. Whereas I feel like the you know the ambition for Dune should be that there is there is it can bear a lot of scrutiny after the fact. Um, I think it, I, I think I, it, I, I feel like yeah. I feel like I've come down too too kind of negatively on, on this film. Um, but I've stated my reservations about Vilna's work and, and how I don't think this is you know, the, the perfect adaptation that I could imagine, but um, I did really enjoy it, <laughs> I should say. And, you yeah. know, I, I, there there are many, many things to really admire about this film, both in its presentation, in the in the, the performances, um, you know, uh, uh, certainly in the soundtrack, which is astonishing, I think. Yeah, I think, I think there's no one part of it that I think is, like, perfect, apart from maybe, maybe the costuming. Um mm. But I do agree. Like, I think it's an extraordinary thing. I like, I, I, I'm kind of glad that I saw it again yesterday because I feel like I can bring a more positive angle on it to this. Because actually, I think if we recorded this last week, I, you know, I walked out of it with a friend. We both sat there for half an hour talking about it and realized that both of us, it like faded quite quickly from our minds. It hadn't really left an impression. Um, and <clears throat> I still think it's sort of dancing on that knife edge between like um, substantive and 
confection in the way that a crisp does. Um, <laughs> a crisp is not a meal, you know? Um, um, but I ate the whole tube this time and uh, I'm glad I did. Uh, but should we, should we, we've been speaking for 20 minutes. Should we draw the line here on terms of non-spoilery things and just get into some meat of it in terms of where we thought felt it didn't, didn't work as a hmm. adaptation. Yeah. Let's do it. Um, so something that occurred to me and I'll just kick us off with, yeah, I think we have to pick, there's so many different angles to pick to go into this, but to talk about the tragedy of the Atreides, something that really surprised me um, about this adaptation particularly given that it is an adaptation of the first half of the book hmm. is that um, the, of the many sort of sacrifices made in terms of the, the kind of the truncation and the kind of minimalist kind of approach to dialogue is almost the entire um, palace drama or, or inter-character kind of drama of the Atreides group. Hmm. Um, and that, I, I minded it far less the second time, but I wanted to find out what you guys thought about it because for me, there's, you know, for me, like the, what everyone, you know, the, the template for the kind of the first book of, of Song of Ice and Fire or the, the kind of beloved first season of Game of Thrones is the, the first third of Dune, the novel, right? Yeah. Like this noble family who you want to like, despite them certainly having their own issues and Frank Herbert maybe liking the Atreides too much is a problem for a later date, but um, you know the the noble the, the the noblest fascist house of all the fascist space houses <laughs> is um, is you know committed is is sent by the emperor or the king to take on a charge that is ennobling but also a trap and that is you know that is the start of Game of Thrones it's the start of Dune and there's so much in that and the probably the most humane part of the book for me is all of the drama that arises from that as the house packs up to go to Dune, the, the kind of scenes where each of the kind of advisor figures, uh, Gurney, Duncan, um, Dr. Yue, and Thufia Hawat all give Paul something. And, you know, and then they become the principal kind of suspects in the, you know, drama of who is going to betray them, the way that, you know, the, the, the division that rises up between Jessica, Paul's mother, and Leto, the Duke, um, you know, as suspicions pass back and forth and the kind of tragedy of all her ultimately not knowing um, whether or not um, he trusts her until after he is dead. Um, all of that, you know, kind of, you know, UA story and how that kind of um, uh, plays out, the significance of Peter DeVries, none of that is in the film. And yet, to me, it seemed like such rich kind of dramatic soil, mm. right? Like if you're going to tell, if you're going to bring audiences into this world in a way that told them a story, which is June's issue to some extent, um, with a start, a middle, and an end, just like the kind of the fall of House Atreides as they arrive on Arrakis would be that film. And I was initially so surprised that UA is basically in three scenes before he's revealed to be the betrayer yeah. and then he's discarded again. Um, as soon as I almost realized that was what was happening, I sort of like switched off the first time I watched the film. And then the, because I just was like, well, this is sort of, and then there's a line I think that they added for the film where you know, uh, Jessica and Leto are falling asleep the night of the night that the betrayal is going to happen. And Leto turns to her and says, I should have married you, which is something that like, if you're going to preserve a, 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 an arc for her and her relationship with Paul and very much through the last line of the novel, you definitely don't have him say then. Um, uh, that's not to say they should preserve the last line of the novel because they definitely shouldn't. But like, um, there is there was something really strange about how kind of like it almost disinterested the film felt in like probably the most intricate set of relationships that this book has at this stage. Um, the second time I watched it, I was a bit more sort of forgiving of that because I felt like, oh, if I sort of if I feel less if I'm if I reach less into the screen looking for the interior lives of these characters, and I just take this as a kind of like very sort of um, arm's length introduction to this world and this parade of characters and almost the inevitability of that fate, which is sort of represented, I think, by the soundtrack in a big way. I think it does work far better. But anyway, I was talking about it a bunch. I was wondering how that whole sequence landed for you. I think that they've, uh, they've really just hum hamstrung themselves for the next film by not building those relationships up because why mm. the hell are you going to know any of what Paul does next? Because his relationship with his father and the sense of duty that comes from that and his mother, that evolving relationship. And, you know, the, the various fates of the, the mentors that uh, bring mm. him to Arrakis. 
that they're, they're all part of the, what what he does like he, he thinks about them relentlessly even as he's you know reaching new levels of consciousness or, or you know having his worldview changed by uh the new people he's meeting um it, it's, it's like without that grounding what's who what is paul to a cinema audience uh yeah. and mm. it's, it, it, his whole journey is it, that's the foundation of it and if I, I kind of I, I felt that loss as as a kind of a, again as a rich scene that I would wish to have seen explored thoroughly, yeah. and I'd rather that the film just cover if the the, the siege and the fall of uh, the city or the, and the fall of the palace was the finale to the film, and it mm. actually spent the time actually building up that and it, and the film and the series was like three or four films long, and that, that, knowing that they're all going to make loads of money, I'm sure because it's you know brilliantly produced. And has obviously done extremely well by the looks of it. Uh, so you know, why not spread that story? Give give these moments more time. Um, and yeah. it's it's kind of uh, I don't I don't think it's even sacrificed for spectacle, because I think I thought the um, the actual fall of the city, the fall of the palace, was extraordinary. <laughs> the, mm-hmm. uh, the the final fall. I, I mean, it's easy to uh, I think perhaps like we haven't paid enough attention to how incredible this film looks at points. Um, and the, the the actual fall of the, the Harkonnen and uh, Sadorka invasion of the final city, and the, the, the kind of death note of the Atreides, uh, is this kind of evolving sequence where it's almost like a city descends on a city, and they both slowly c- collapse into each other in a sort of horrifying cavalcade of s- slow destruction, uh, as as this kind of pulsing soundtrack, which is incredible, uh, does like actually finally comes into its full flourish. And uh, there's a, a scene where ornithopters are kind of flying through gunfire, and people are having knife fights on the ground. And one of the things I love about Dune's future is that uh, it's not like all, it's not about guns; it's about actually like really brutal, horrible <laughs> close combat fighting mm-hmm. because of the way the shield technology works. It's actually a very good dramatic device because it means you can actually see the characters up, up close, mm-hmm. actually having to murder each other horribly, and it, it gives you a, a sense of consequence to this violence. Um, and also, I don't think I've that. seen a better special effect in a film in a long time than those huge fucking ships exploding oh. and their explosions being momentarily contained within their shields before yes. whichever shield yeah. generator just gets destroyed in it. Oh, God. <laughs> and the, the, the flares, yeah. these giant kind of like enormous sort of spherical ships that come down, the kind of bombers, the carpet bombing ships, that the uh, the kind of the way the mm. flares come out are these bombs that descend. And of course, the, the trick to shields is that only slow movement goes through them they repel anything equal with equal force that is that is quick so uh, a lot of the weaponry and a lot of the fighting in dune uh, is about kind of getting very close to the target and then very slowly infiltrating before deliver- delivering the killing blow and they have these bombs that do that <laughs> which is nuts when you see it because those bombs are almost like drop pods but they sort of break in midair and then slowly go through the shield and erupt and it's just incredible yeah, as a concept it's amazing uh, I'd so perfectly realized, and it's, it's it's true to how the books describe a lot of that stuff. But that f- to be realized with such flair, and without kind of, and also to show it so slowly in lots of ways, just the, the slow decimation of vast structures. Um, you know, Danny Villeneuve is just so good at that. Like he has this uh, this level of tall ships, ships that are skyscrapers that come down. I think um, in a few, it's a motif in a few of his films, and mm. it's such an unusual kind of alien anti-gravity site this, this is what the kind of far far flung future might look like that such huge structures could hang in such a way and do war and violence to the ground underneath them uh is i think it, that was a, i can't think of anything quite like it um and that for that to be the denouement to the film um with the, the basis of the the fall of the atreides um would have been i think perhaps again it's, it's always easy to armchair Kind of correct a form mm. to the mm. way you want it, but I just feel like that that would have been just a, a pretty unforgettable arc for, a, for for one contained film that could then build into a series. Um, yeah, I so- wonder if I mean I can't imagine a studio signing off on that in a way because I, I mean mm. I think they end where they do because they're desperate to give Paul a win at the end and they want <laughs> they want to set up some kind of positive momentum and you know that's why it has this f- fucking terrible ending line of. This is only the beginning. <laughs> oh, that is, I want to. I want to. Let's talk about Chani a different time because holy shit, that was a bad desert end. Like, power. Yeah, desert damn. power. This is only the beginning. De- oh, not no. desert power. I hate it. I know. I mean, of all the lines to pick is your kind of yeah <laughs> the, the thing you're trying. They to didn't even. Oh, yeah. They didn't even the balls to steal 
they're riding a giant worm from Gears of War 2. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I do agree, Tom. I, I, this is the thing. I, I, I think this is the film that we were... This is as good a cursed project as, <laughs> as I think we could <laughs> squeeze out of Hollywood. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm totally with you that the, what I wanted from this film was 2.5 hours of, you know, paranoia basically yeah because like, that's that's what and that's genuinely what i think of when i think of dune like hmm. paul's messiah messianic arc going into the desert that's that seems to that's not what i think of when i think of dune i think about those those kind of mentor characters Thufir Hawat and you know liet kynes all of whom are such ambiguous complex figures all hmm. trying to second guess each other and trying to work out who could possibly be a traitor and like none of that comes through like I don't, I, and Thufir Hawat and his relationship with Jessica is one of the kind of the, like a, one of the most kind of scintillating parts of, mm -hmm. of Dune because they are both good people, but they both suspect each other of being the traitor. And, and to have somebody as fucking amazing as Stephen McKinley Henderson as Thufir Hawat and then, mm. <laughs> then have him only say like four lines in the entire yeah, thing, right. just like, oh, well, okay. And then, yeah, it's... with Leah Kynes as well, who is just this, who's a brilliant um, bit of misdirection in the book because uh, he, in the book, is is set up to be this sort of liminal figure who can go between siege and and uh, and villages, Village. as they say, but then um, gets kind of quite promptly bopped off. But they built up as being this kind of incredibly kind of exciting figure who can essentially deliver the Fremen to Paul and who he needs to convince. And in this, I mean, they, they she has a role to play, but again, it's it's just incredibly perfunctory. I feel um, for the kind of impact that 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 character should have. Um, yeah. But then I don't know whether this stuff really hurts it as a film or whether it's just a missed opportunity from the perspective of an, of an adaptation of something I particularly love. I think I that's think, see, I, that, that. Sorry, Gantam. I I I think that yeah, that's definitely a question. But what I always think of is. Um, the interesting decisions to keep certain things in, like uh, uh, the bit where uh, I think it's Duncan Ido shows everyone a sand compactor. So have you seen <laughs> the Fremen right. have amazing technology? Have you seen my sand compactor? And it's it's actually like, like why is this in the film? And that's an <laughs> extended bit later when Paul is in the tent and he actually demonstrates in front of the camera what this device does to sand and how it lets the Fremen ambush all. Yeah, that was that was five minutes they could have spent watching Doctor Wellington UA sweat or something. <laughs> yeah. That's what I want, really. Um, and also, um, one of my favourite tweets uh, was um, uh, saying one of the things I thought like quite powerfully in the middle of the film is where you, you cut into uh, the Harkonnen fortress, and the Harkonnens are still as as they kind of have to be and are in the book, just an absolute flipping cardboard cheese villain uh entity that it's just it seems doesn't seem to have like i mean they uh there's always i find there's almost nothing to say about them really they're just pure evil i think i've got quite a lot to say about hawkins but yeah let's get there interesting <laughs> um yeah uh but also the bit where an, an ant seems to be eating some poo out of a bowl that <laughs> it cuts it to a the scene spider you, proxy? you can't not have the spider proxy and it's like, and then it, then uh, like the Bene Gesserit leader uses the voice to command it to leave. I was like, oh, so you left this in, but <laughs> but mm. you left all the other stuff on the table, <laughs> all the potential character interactions you could have had between the people who actually matters to the story and the the hero's uh, horrid horrid journey to his final <laughs> position. Um, but we do have the ant thing. We still have um, that. <laughs> we don't have any Fade Ruther, which I think is interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. Right, I was wondering. I, th I, was wondering, I thought they might have rolled both characters into the one. Uh, what into one into side. Beast Rabban? Mm, um, that's what I thought they'd done. No, I think I think I think Fade Ruther is coming, presumably. Yeah. It's, 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 am I right in thinking that? Sorry, uh, am I right in thinking that he's set up at some point to be like a rival Quizats Hadrak? Um, is that Im implied at all? I, I, that's my recollection. Not necessarily. I don't think so. No, because the, the start, like, so the, the book, the film basically ends at the first start of, end of part one of the book. And the start of part two of the book is, I think, where Phaedroth is introduced for the first time. So they could get away with not. Oh, uh, so he's off. Um, mm. Because, of the, the, cause, yeah, because he's introduced on Gaiety Prime. Um, 
but like but the, yeah like oh man there's so much here like i think so for me the process i've gone through with trying to unpack this is like what is me secretly wanting to adapt to dune which is you know like a novel i like have, i find really fascinating and what is me kind of, and therefore kind of critiquing, critiquing this on that basis and what are the things that i feel like are setting them up for problems and i think kind of identified some of them that like um coming into the next film um they have sort of failed. They've missed the opportunities to do a bunch of the setup for things that become very significant. The fact that Thufir Hawat goes and becomes the new Mentat for mm. Baron Harkonnen, um, which is not even implied. Like he, he vanishes from the movie. It, it, he can obviously yeah. reappear in that position, but there's none of the work done to explain how he got there. Similarly, the fact that Gurney survives, goes on to join some smugglers, will then later obviously reunite with Paul. Like I saw an interview uh, recently with um josh brolin i think it was one of the first times that they really strongly implied that a part two was actually going to happen where he was saying mm. that like oh and i've been filming some scenes with javier bardem who plays stilgar and of course they will have some very significant scenes together in part two it should get made but that was like but the film doesn't give us any reason to expect that you know gurney's journey doesn't end gurney's journey the gurney journey doesn't end with anything other than him <laughs> charging across an airfield holding a sword uh, trying to achieve something for some reason like that sequence is so spectacular and yet mm. what his plan is <laughs> we don't know like you know and it's, i mean i don't like this that i have zero negative 100 interest in going cinema since on this at all because it's exactly the wrong way to read a film like this however when you pare things down to imagery and world building so much you do end up at a position where like you know, um, where does, you know, where does show start to fail the same criteria that you'd apply to show, not tell where it's like, you've told us that Gurney and Duncan Idaho have created the, turned the Atreides legions into one of the most threatening military forces um, in the galaxy. But we have no sense of how or why they have done that, what it means to Gurney, how like the fact that the fact that they cast, I mean, it's interesting that they, they, you know, cast, uh, I, God, the subject of Liet Kynes is a huge one, but it's really interesting that the character of Liet Kynes, who in the the book, I think, serves the role of being a, um, you know, this is very much from the perspective of, of, of the books, you know, um, a man born on Arrakis, but to an explicitly colonizing force, you know, the imperial ecologists who came to colonize the world and who kind of holds the perspectives of both worlds and then kind of but believes himself to be the master of both of them until the point where that is proved to be very much not the case when he is just killed out of nowhere and by a um you know obviously wounded in the desert but um unable to master that environment and then the complete sort of shift in that character um to you know um being played by uh, a woman of color and representing a kind of um uh, like a more kind of um, resolute or kind of sturdy bridge between cultures in a way, um, which is, you know, really tricky territory for that character to enter, I think, whose end represents instead of like this acknowledgement that the desert was bigger than me the whole time is actually mm. this exultant, the desert is bigger than you as well, you Sardaukar dickheads, thump, thump, thump. Um, like it's a cool moment, but it completely inverts that character. Um, in a way that I don't necessarily dislike, as you said, I don't think it necessarily changes much of the film. I think you can tell, totally tell the story from that point of view, but certainly in sort of, um, in finding their opportunities, I think, to diversify the cast specifically, they end up actually shutting some doors that are quite interesting. Gurney is a really interesting one. There's a, there's a, a writer that I would recommend anyone who's interested in this read a lot of Harris Durrani, who's written a ton about Dune, um, for the Washington Post and, and for his own blog and for Tor recently. Um, specifically from a, a Muslim perspective, but also has a really interesting perspective on Gurney Halleck and points out all the ways in the book that indicates that um, Gurney is a um, is is coded in the novels as very much being a um, uh, a person of color themselves and a victim of the the Harkonnens specifically as a slave and coming at it very much with that perspective. Zero of that in the film. Right, hmm. uh, particularly hmm. in casting, you know, and doesn't even sing, which seems like an act of cowardice. Um, <laughs> but pointedly, I'm, 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 I'm certainly off on one. Pointedly, that you know, so Gurney's fate left completely open. Thufir's fate left completely open. Um, Wellington Ua, we barely know him. Um, Duncan <laughs> gets about as close. Duncan Idaho gets about as close to a a kind a complete arc um, as anyone gets, but he's he's gone now. 
and it, so it means that when those threads resume in part two, um, I sort of I feel like the film has already set itself up to kind of struggle a little bit to um, to reconcile them. And that is that is my way of trying to turn what is effectively a moan about the adaptation not doing the bits and the books I like into a um, into I think where I think it's it is sort of its determination to pare everything down um, ends up throwing out babies with the bathwater. And speaking of babies in bathwater, I think I do want to talk about the Harkonnens because um, <laughs> um, because I think I think this is actually it's it uh, and and this is maybe as big a thing, but like I was really struck by how cartoonish they are, and they're they're always kind of presented in this way. And they're mm. cartoonish in the book as well. But pointedly, I think Baron, like Vladimir Harkonnen in the novel, is one of the kind of the aspects of that novel that has aged by far the worst and that shows a degree of kind of, um, you know, a, a, an ugly streak in its writing that I, uh, I'm happy to see go, right? Like, um, like the Baron's like homosexuality and the way that it is closely tied to his sort of abusiveness in the book is kind of gross and i'm glad it's gone but it's replaced by this sort of strain and then and the way that the baron's like body you know the kind of the there's like it's you know the baron in the novels is both like deeply homophobic deeply fat phobic in a way that is sort of pretty grim and the film's response to this is to basically turn him into like hr geiger's boss baby like this sort <laughs> of <laughs> Like this, and not only that, but to turn all of the Harkonnens into smaller, increasingly smaller boss babies, <laughs> like um, you know, <laughs> that like um, like the you know the Beast Raban is literally just like a smaller Baron Harkonnen, and um, and a lot of I think the kind of the complexity of the Harkonnen perspective, which you get in part two, doesn't feel like there's a lot of room for it to arrive necessarily. Right, or for that to be an environment where Thufir Hawat is capable of sort of, you know, negotiating a kind of um, start building a trap of his own, um, uh, because of how like because of the fact that they they live in a huge egg and bathe in only tar, <laughs> you know. What I, mean? <laughs> <laughs> I just say I do. Um, there were a couple of th- I, I agree with you entirely. But I, there were a couple of things I did like about the Baron's presentation. One being the sound effect of his his little hover hover pods, whatever they are, yeah, mm-hmm. um, popping on. Um, the other thing is uh, I I haven't I feel like Stellan Skarsgård was really channeling uh, Marlon Brando in, oh, in totally. Apocalypse Now. Yeah. Like yeah. there's they're even just like actually wholly kind of recreating some gestures from that where uh, Colonel Kurtz just looks so fucking tired uh, and confused in his, uh, what, what's the, the famous, the snail on the razor speech that he gives in Apocalypse Now. And <laughs> there, there's just something, in, I mean, that, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that was, that was like a note that they were consciously trying to kind Definitely. of recreate. There's a bit where he's sort of um, he's facing almost like three quarters away from the camera and just turns to deliver again that sort of slightly t- on edge tired uh, monologue and it's like it's pure it's pure uh, apocalypse now like that moment is the way he mm. delivers his lines uh, and when he's discovered at the end of that film he's often he's often three quarter lit three quarters facing away just speaking almost like in narration over like it's it's absolutely got to be. An absolute one to one command, like uh, written into the script note to to realize it in this way. I think that's cool, though. I think that sort of gives them a, him a bit more kind of uh, interiority than was certainly present in the Lynch version, where he's just sort of like a <laughs> capering villain, really. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think it's oh, that's what I mean. It's like I'm a bit torn about it because I think I think it's really effective. And again, that thing that you know, I feel like I've kind of come down hard, but like. Every single still of the film, you, the, it looks incredible. Like the, watching it again, I was kind of like waiting for a duff one, you know, one you wouldn't mm. take a screenshot of, and they're all amazing. And like the the image of the Baron, like after after Leto's death when he cracks the tooth and he releases the poison, like him sort of like scrunched up into the ceiling on his sort of anti grav really cool. pods, yeah. like a like a kind of growth or a limpet. Like that stuff is is really really um, really just great like science fiction i think it kind of just tickled that thing that um i really 
uh, you know, the, the strangeness of it is very, very compelling. Um, and I do think, as I say, I do think they success. And I think the performance is great, actually. Like, um, but it's that thing of there's so much richness there and almost very little room for it to come out. Or, I mean, even to, even to keep it as strange as it is for the strangeness of the Harkonnen um, sort of um, homeworld to become normal to you, to allow you to see the, the humanity underneath it, because that's going to become very important, right? Like, you know, the the kind of the ambition of Phaedrath, the, the cruelty of the Baron, like these, these are things that are ultimately very human, as inhumane as they appear, or as they are, as and as, as characters' behaviors are. Um, and I sort of, yeah, I do wonder how they, they, they go further than this. And the thought that occurred to me, and it keeps occurring to me, because I talk about Game of Thrones a lot, because there's a way of kind of like explaining kind of what Dune, the first novel is in some ways. Um, but I think weirdly now is the perfect time to adapt to Dune, but it's ideal venue would probably in some ways be prestige TV. Like we talk about like, how would you do mm. a first film? But I think there's probably an amazing season of TV in the first third of Dune, hmm. you know, yeah. culminating with that kind of, that kind of like apocalyptic destruction of the, of Arakeen and, and the Atreides kind of plan. Um, and um, obviously trying to create, you know, 12, how long episodes of TV with the same production values of the film is an enormous ask. Um, and I just don't know if Hans, you know, I don't know if Hansen has got that, that amount of big wumps in him. <laughs> um, and that's a lot of wumps. Um, but there's, there's certainly like, I keep having this feeling of like, I would also love to see this just absolutely unpacked. Um, as it is, I sort of find myself um, looking forward to the next one, but slight, in a slightly guarded way, I think, like kind of waiting to see how they, what if the babies return or if they remain out with the bathwater. I think the, yeah, there's one last thing about the Harkonnen, I suppose, is that I guess the point of them is that they're just the the most, the, the clearest and purest expression of the imperialist competitive uh situation that the emperor has created for mankind essentially is that uh, he pits houses the great houses against one another relentlessly so that none become too powerful but all exert total dominance over the areas that he wants them to uh, to dominate and the harkonnen uh, as a as a family as a kind of uh, as a house are the purest representation of that ideal that the most ruthless and most efficient at doing that one thing um and at such, there's very little room within that that sort of power structure for them to be, be relatable people at all. <laughs> like, how do you then make them even slightly sympathetic? I mean, ha, why not just uh, at that point just have them be the Geiger babies <laughs> and at least look cool <laughs> as as they you know yeah. uh, fly up to the ceiling and go to the fetal position to suddenly kind of be very vulnerable from. Yeah. I think there's a scene in the novels, and it's coming very soon. If if the if it can do, because it's also very faithful to the books in a lot of ways. It's like the same scenes proceed in the same yeah. order. They've just been sort of um, winnowed down to their kind of like their their kind of their most visual elements. Um, there's the scene coming, which is the kind of arena scene with Fade Rautha, the kind of young heir to the Arconans or would be heir to the Arconans, in the arena. Um, and the significance of which of his blades is poisoned and which isn't, and the fact that he's mm. used to doing these show fights where a slave is sent out to fight him who is already drugged, you know, and it says so much about the cruelty of the Harkonnens that that's how they approach their kind of like, you know, martial spectacle. You know, they are huge assholes. There's no getting around that. <laughs> but there's a lot in that and like in the fear that, you know, what you know that 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 particular uh, Atreides captive manages to kind of get a bit closer than than is comfortable to killing him, and there's this then there's the palace drama of the Harkonnens and how that relates to Thufia Howat's new role. All of this to me is like really interesting stuff, like from a dramatic perspective, and there's tons there. Um, and I suspect when the next movie arrives, if that scene is in it, it will be like a very powerfully depicted thirty second kind of introduction to Fade Rautha, but with none of the um none of the broader context or the kind of like I say the, hu the genuinely I think the human side right like the you know the to the extent that they're obviously the Geiger babies but they're also like very much and this is the source of all the problems I think with the depiction of the books as well like sort of like Caligula's Rome or something like that it, there's a sort of decadence to them which is like deeply petty and also completely gross 
Um, and and that's stuff I think you can you can play with. Like the Baron is ultimately like quite a petulant, childish figure as well as a terrifying one, which is very appropriate to how he dies. Um, you know. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm potentially getting too far into film two, really, in terms of those ways. But I do feel like. I don't know. I kind of want to, this is, and this is all down that thread of interiority, right? Like it's all on let me inside these characters a little bit more beyond the superficial. Mm. We, in fact, talking exactly about that, shall we talk about Jessica? Because yeah. mm. if anybody, if any character needed to be less accessible <laughs> in this film, I would have thought it'd be Jessica because, uh, but she's incredibly emotional here. Um, whereas in the book, like her entire character is about having huge emotions, but completely restrained beneath incredible training, incredible steel. And it's I, I don't again, it's one of these things, ad- adaptation versus the film in isolation, where I think it's a terrific performance from a, a brilliant actor, R- Rebecca Ferguson. Um, but it's, it's just so strange because, I mean, particularly Rebecca Ferguson, who is really good at playing understated characters whose emotions run deep but are covered by a layer of steel. Like, she's done that in really well in a whole bunch of roles. And yet here she's kind of notably, like, having a breakdown in nearly every other scene. And that's completely reasonable because the, the amount of stress she's under is is obviously intolerable, uh, sending, essentially, you know, sending her son... Uh, into a room where Charlotte Rampling's horrid box is going to kill him. Um, (laughs) But at the same time, you know, even in comparison with Paul or Leto, who are meant to be like, Leto is meant to be the emotional one of the family, they are incredibly less declarative and more subtle in their performances uh, than Jessica is. I think it's just an odd inversion. I I don't think it hurts the film again. I I really liked it, but um, I do wonder what you think. I th- I thought I, I I so Jessica that presentation of Jessica is my favorite thing about the film I think, and I think it's less that um, it doesn't work because of the way that the characters are presented. I think it's actually just that the like it's so it's the what how is she because they're all like this right like even you know you say Lito is still the emotional one within June that's like a a different bar than it might be in a different story. Right. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's like, he sometimes gets shirty at a meeting. Um, and then he, you know, and pointedly, you know, I mean, the the fact that the film, the film in some ways gives Leto more to do emotionally because a big part Mm. of the book is him not saying things to his wife, um, that he's thinking, but, but I think, you know, so, but I think obviously like the thing the film does, I think identify correctly is this, like the relationship between Paul and Jessica is going to be very, very significant. And they, um, and they're both point of view characters in the book who have a huge amount of interiority. And I think, and that gives the film the challenge of like, how do you show a character who has these really deeply tumultuous emotions, but isn't letting them out. And I think that makes the, the correct decision, both directorially and through, um, uh, Rebecca Ferguson's performance, which is you do let them out. You kind of do show them because it gives the film some humanity. And then you also show the moments where she has that steel. And there's a ton of things I really like in the film. And I kind of want to kind of talk about that because like, I think, um, I think the presentation of the voice is very effective oh, it's brilliant. Uh, yeah. and, and yeah. it sets something up, which is the fact that the, when you hear the voice, the soundtrack cuts out and what you hear is a lot of women's voices, um, of different sort of registers, um, gives us a hint of what the voice is going to turn out to be. And what reverend mothers are like these are these are facts that jessica doesn't know yet right like why does mm. it you know why does it sound like infinite grannies when when you use the voice <laughs> well <laughs> you know um guess what your manifest destiny is right like the, the, there are these sort of really interesting things there when i first saw the film that was a really good example of something that i was like that's such a wonderful aesthetic choice why haven't they explained it and then the second time i saw the film i was like i'm glad they didn't explain it like let, let, let that be a sort yeah. of aha moment later on anyway like those moments of steel for her, for me, work really well alongside the moments when she is obviously visibly emotional. And I think what that holds in counterpoint is Paul, where um, like uh, Timothy Chalamet's performance is, I think, really good, but yeah. it's so controlled from the start that I think it. I, I go back and forth on this because the second time I thought that, because Paul's journey, right, is he is a boy, he's 15 in the. Um, uh, he's 15 in the novel, and I think he's sort of Chalamet vampire age in this, where he could be <laughs> any, he could be 900. <laughs> like, um, you know, um, so, um, and um, 
and he is like he is basically a boy right up until the point that that like he, he has too much sherbet in a tent um <laughs> and he emerges as um like the, the god emperor time king worm master the fourth you know what i mean and like that's uh, and that change in him in the book is really unsettling when mm, like almost the terrible. moment that the ducal signet is given to him he changes jessica becomes af- you know you gestured this earlier tom like you know jessica becomes afraid of him when when he sort of becomes the Kwisatz Haderach in that way, and it's just this hot, like horrifying switch, um, and there's a moment. I thought the, the most powerful part of his performance in the film is in that tent after it's all fallen yeah. apart, where he screams at her, like you, you know, you and your you know, Bene Gesserit have turned me into this freak. Um, but in a way, it's almost an inversion of like the the way that art goes in the book, where he's much more emotional, and then he hits that wall and passes through it. Um, and has this impossible exposure to time it's and, and causality and emerges from that as this very different figure, very a much more commanding figure. And the, the, the film has some of those moments at the very end um, and then somewhat, but there's, I think, an insufficient change in him for that moment to land because the performance so prior to that isn't, doesn't let you in enough, right? Um he is, spends a lot of time wearing a big coat and looking at the sea. Um, and I think maybe that again is a casualty of losing those scenes with his mentors where some of his doubts and kind of insecurities are voiced, right? It almost gets there. It doesn't quite. There's also like, so Paul hits this wall where he has this kind of, obviously this um, messianic transformation, but it's like, how, what, how does he choose to use this eventually? How does he, how does he, choose to behave or what do you do with this journey uh, and you know the, the power that he has and his also powers of leadership that he inherits from the duke um and there's a point where he's just his decision is fuck all of this fuck all this mess uh and it, but in a very cold calculated way a trained bene Gesserit way where it's just like this mm. i'm uh, this will be dismantled now <laughs> And it's uh, the reason why he chooses to come to that is actually, I think, comes from his lost father and uh, all of the, you know his lost friends and all of the and I think is a Caladan and you know that's lost too and all, all this beauty that's gone out of his life and the, the kind of uh, the nihilism that flows from that and I'm not sure that like the character we get with Paul in the end at the end of the film has those tools or has the kind of stuff there. Um, that I, it feels as though the second film is going to have a lot, have to have a lot of flashbacks, guys. They're going to have to get some of those actors back in to do some flashbacks to kind of set some of this stuff back up retroactively uh, to mm-hmm. just make some of this work. Uh, and, and failing that, they're going to have to just, I don't know, they've got to do something with Paul because he, you could have this stony faced, um, kind of very subtle performance, which I think is very good. I think it really, I think he's, he's great in the film. Um, but I don't think like, if he's going to be the linchpin, if he's going to be the, the character, is this the character journey you really want to follow? Then it, I don't know. It feels like I, I need to be shown a little bit more of it, which is why I, I agree with Chris, I think, in that seeing Jessica's moments of emotion in the film, it, it felt like, you know, precious water in the desert. Oh my God, a bit of humanity coming from someone somewhere. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. We've got f- some fear. Gosh, yeah. Mm. I mean, yes, this is scary. I, I, so my emotion is kind of coming out because I could see her fear. Or she knows that Paul's going into this terrible situation, and uh, that that scene is is great. The scene with the the, the horrible pain oh, box yeah. um, is such a oh, it's such I, it's great in the Lynch film too. I think um, I, it's because it's such a great idea for a scene, isn't it? <laughs> like a yeah. mother telling her son to go and just go through this horrible test. <laughs> With the Gom Jabbar, which is obviously, I thought was very well realized as well. Um, I tell you, just, there's something interesting. I went after watching the, the the film twice, and I particularly loved that scene. I went back and read the description of that scene in in the book, and it, it's a lot more it's a lot more wordy in the book, but actually to not no particularly great end, I don't think. And in fact, mm. uh, I think the way it's pared down in the Vilna version is is really effective. But he also adds something um, to it in the vision. So in the in the book. Um, Right. Paul imagines his hand burning, yeah, uh, which is also in, in this. Although that the, the the most of the pain is is in, you know implied in the Timothy fault. Chalamet's performance, which is mm. fantastic in the scene. But then he does begin to have visions. But the, 
it's not just his hand burning, it's, it's his hand over a bed of sand. And then that burning gets intermingled with other inchoate visions of, of Dune and the destruction that will follow. Mm. And rather than this be like the climax of horror, which he has to resist, it actually seems to give Paul resolve to see through this challenge as though like the pain is now tied to like his possession of Dune in some way. And this uh, terrifies the Reverend Mother as she sees this sort of this awakening in Paul. And that, I, I, th I thought that was a really uh, cool addition. <laughs> yeah. And it, one, one of the instances really. in which like uh, Denis Villeneuve's use of symbolism is incredibly powerful and effective and articulate in that instance, I think. And there's, there's, there's a bunch of other things I really like as well in terms of his symbolism. I think the bull imagery that he uses is, mm. is, uh, is quite mm. subtle and clever. Um, and uh, in fact, well, I think this famously never tricked. <laughs> 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 well, no, I mean, you see, well, the thing is, I mean, it's, it's whether Leto's the, the bull or the matador, but in fact, it turns out that he's the red flag, really, <laughs> in the whole situation. And in fact, Leto is, uh, stars in what I think are the, some of the, the most uh, effective um, scenes in the, in the film, to my surprise, um, the ones in which people actually talk to each other and explain <laughs> themselves a little bit like there's a scene between him and paul on on some kind of graveyard promontory uh where he talks about you know paul being his son and that being enough and uh then there's a the scene between him and jessica where uh he he says you're going to keep paul safe and she begins to answer he says i'm not asking his mother i'm asking the bene Gesserit. and you know and so rarely do characters kind of articulate their their fears and conflicts and their their desires in this film that it feels like such a such a relief and a revelation to have somebody give you that kind of access to them, and I, I think that sets up the the tragedy of Leto in a, in a kind of kind of more profound way where everybody around him knows essentially that he in that seal ceremony everybody there knows that he is signing his own death warrant. Mm. Yeah. Apart from Leto and maybe Paul, and there's that that look between them just before he presses his signet ring into the into the wax, uh, where he looks mm. at Paul and Paul sort of nods his head, and it's a sort of ambiguous look, but you can see like Leto's thinking, "Oh, have I just fucked this for my son?" <laughs> and, and Paul doesn't really know what that means at that stage, and I, I think that that is, uh, is a brilliant um, wordless yeah. piece of acting. There's there's another which I really like as well, which is obviously like to to stay on 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 Leto for a moment. Like his big moment is rescuing the spice harvesters, right? Like that's his and and the film does some nice setup. The additional world building detail of him confiding in Paul that he he didn't want to be Duke either and he wanted to be a pilot is like gets its payoff when he kind of gets to be a pilot, right? Like he get you know um, he gets to be the heroic pilot at the end, and that's really the last major scene he's in before well actually no it's not because his death scene is significant as well um and but there's a really nice moment where like the in the book there's and i went back and forth on this but in the book there's quite a lot of moments in that scene that really labor what a great dude <laughs> Leto Atreides is <laughs> like there's a line i like from a world building point of view but and i don't miss it now which is um he's you know he has great eyes and he's the one who sees the worm before the spotter aircraft do right um and then he he's what and then you know they and when they call it in the the response is like you know who you know whose spotting was this who gets the bounty basically like you know there's a there's a bounty on spotting worm sign and I love that world building detail because it tells you a lot about how the economy of this place functions right hmm. like the the gig economy of riding around in a balloon looking for worms um, on a shit planet. Um, and then you know, Lito, but it gives the Leto this moment in the book of saying like, no, 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 I, it's Duke Leto of you know Atreides, like um, the chill Duke, the cool Duke who loves to party. You keep the tithe, <laughs> you keep the bounty, and split it among yourselves, and I'll save your lives. And I got beers in the back of the ornithopter <laughs> <laughs> as they lower to the ground. Um, um, and the film does a lot of that far more quickly and quietly. And there's so many little moments in it I really like, like the fact that he tells Paul not stay in the, like, I think a, a dumber movie would be have him say, Paul, stay in the ornithopter. And then Paul wouldn't stay in the ornithopter. He'd go out to the bed of drugs like teenagers do. Um, um, but no, he says, get to the back of the ornithopter and bring them in. And then Paul kind of takes that order a bit too far and goes out into the desert. But 
there's no um you know it passes really quickly and then you know and then paul's the one who suggests throwing out the shield generators to make space for people or to shed some weight and the duke of greece and seeing them work together and seeing the kind of like the cooperativeness of that and how it says a lot about leto i think in that moment and sort of you get the scene that kind of it's almost waiting for someone to tell him what a great duty is <laughs> you know what i mean for everyone to clap and the one thing you do get is this sideways glance from Liet Kynes, who has every reason to think that this is just another kind of imperial plant who's here to kind of, you know, extract things from the world. And particularly in this new version of Liet Kynes, who isn't quite so, um, you know, who's walking in two worlds, isn't as troubled as it is in the book. That kind of makes sense. And that sideways glance of like, this guy's legit. Um is actually, I think, really a nice moment. And it, it it sets you up to kind of want good things for this character who is going to be having a horrible time like two scenes from now. And I thought that was really effective. That is really effective filmmaking. And it's the best, I think, example of the moments where that, um, that sort of bare bones approach, that sort of sparse sort of script does make a case for being able, make a, makes a case for itself as a good, you know, as a replacement for the, you know, you know, expository talkiness of the book, right? That, mm. you know, when you have the right performances and the right setup, you don't need something to be said. Um, I don't, but I, 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 I wish it achieved that more consistency, basically. I love that scene. Uh, I love the sense of distance it creates with how far out they call the worm sign. Like, they, they, they yeah. talk about the distance a lot and, and Villeneuve's amazing at shooting vast distances. Uh, and that sells how big these things are. Like, there, there are some... Um, slightly cheesy almost perhaps meme baiting bits where paul watches info videos which i think is in the book actually um about mm. uh about arrakis and the people of arrakis and that's where you get the uh the desert step um and at the moment i saw that i was like ah oh, someone's gonna clip that that's gonna be the thing and is it in Fortnite? yet it is in Fortnite, right it is in Fortnite. <laughs> yeah it's an emote in Fortnite. right i mean fair play whatever um <laughs> but this does say something oh uh, these ones can be up to like a mile long or something uh that doesn't mean anything until that scene until they called it from so far away because the the weird thing about the worms is that like you could how do you show that on the screen how do you you can't show the entire worm right it you just have to show the sense of distance and how it not on a 12 no <laughs> um that there is a, a, an almost i think an almost rubbish face-to-face -face paul sees worm bit at the end of the film which i think was oh, yeah. like, really touch and go <laughs> yeah that was and in the trailer actually and it, 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 it was, did surprise it me that I mean, it kind of thing pops its head out and just sort of peers at them and you're like mm, I, don't, uh, I don't know about that no it, it's mm. like it's like game recognized game uh, it's like no <laughs> that's not your relationship <laughs> you don't have a relationship it's just, just a creature <laughs> who really wants to eat you because you're in its territory uh but th that scene at least made the worm a terrifying thing and there's the sense of ominous approaching and this is one of the things where again the soundtrack the, the pulsing crescendo of the soundtrack gets there eventually and everything kind of culminates again much much more slowly than in lots of other action films where perhaps the, the whole half just gets immediately chomped but it's that you see this enormous sinkhole and everything sort of slowly being drawn in even as the carry all carries the thing away um and it's again that slowness creates this sense of that huge size this colossal thing that's majestic and terrifying and uh beyond human understanding really uh so it, there's so much like that's for me like a crucial moment in the book as well even though mm. uh, i think chris yeah totally super talky but all the the imagery and the way that uh technology versus the desert is all captured in this really climactic moment that's actually just in a kind of nowhere point in the story it's kind of just in between bits happening as they get to Arrakis mm. uh, and just suddenly becomes this incredibly important moment. Uh, and I actually quite like that. I, th I quite like when Phil's been off the three act structure and because that means that you can have moments of incredible importance come out of nowhere like that. Uh, and you go into the scene, if you don't know the book, I think if you, you go into that, the scene with the harvester, not knowing that it's important. And I think the way that that kind of escalates the way that it, it kind of resolves is a moment that you wouldn't expect, uh, which I think is quite, it's a, a nice part of the way the, the film's structured, actually. Mm. How about that Charney then, eh? I was going to say we should talk about the Fremen. Like, it's, it, it just occurred to me that we spent a lot of time talking about the Atreides um, and the mm. Harkonnens. Um, yeah, I think, I think it was, 
so I I'm fascinated by the promotional campaign for this movie partly because <laughs> oh, I yeah. understand I understand that a large part of their ability to sell this to a younger audience is based on the sort of star power of Timothy Chalamet and Zendaya, and um, and she sure is in this film sorta, of. um, <laughs> um, and and I feel like the. So I think I'm trying to, th- I actually really like, I like, I really like the moments in the film where she's being Chani actually, which is just the last scene pretty much. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. you know, her being, her revealing that she's behind him after, after that he's sort of like overcome a bunch of the Fremen and climbed up the cliffside. Um, you know, her kind of like saying, you're going to die, but you might as well die holding a cool knife. Um, like the, that, you know, the, all of that's quite promising for the character that's going to come. And then the, because uh, I think Chani is a difficult character to adapt in a bunch of different ways mm. uh, because of the book's relationship with gender, frankly, and, and how that's going to go. Um, and I clear they, it's clear that they want to give her more than that, particularly through their opening monologue. But of all the characters whose like destinies or internal lives seem totally subsumed by their expository purpose, it's her, right? And that's partly like textual because partly it's like, she's like in Paul's dreams, literally guiding him into this destiny of some kind and occasionally knifing him. But also the way we see that is exclusively shots of Zendaya turning around to look at the camera while being beautifully lit. Um, Which is more like Paul's been up late at night on Instagram again, rather than like he is seeing something of like broader meaning to his life. It was and then that of, last is part perfume yeah. advert stuff. It was just kind yeah, of felt so throwaway, like right, yeah. yeah, like the glitter in the air, um, mm. yeah, a spice, um, <laughs> by Chani, um, <laughs> um, and then and then I think I and I do think the last line is unforgivable. Like I genuinely think this is only the beginning. I was trying to think. I, I watched it the second time. I didn't even clock it the first time because the first time I was like, "Is this the end of the film?" And I could the soundtrack was telling me it was the end of the film because it was it was whomping up hard in that way that you only get if it's about to be credits. Um, and I didn't even catch it the first time, but the second time that like, he says, there's a power. And then she says, this is only the beginning of what Chani <laughs> you're walking home. <laughs> yeah. Like this, <laughs> like, okay. They, they, they couldn't make a Dune film without showing riding sandworms, even though it comes later in the books, whatever. I get it. You see it briefly. They put that in the trailer as well, which is wild. Um, like, um, Let's so, but as far as, to... yeah, from sorry. her from her perspective, right, she is walking home with a boy she just met, and somewhere nearby, someone nearby is on a bus, <laughs> is in a bus, right? Culturally, at least, um, it's maybe it's more significant <laughs> than that. Um, and what what point is? And then he says, "Cool worm," and she says, "That's only the beginning." Um, <laughs> to what to 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 whose benefit is she saying this? And that I think the reason that moment it frustrates me so much is it's a moment where like Dream Chani and real like Dream Chani and real Chani needed to be different in that moment, unless it was the case that Paul was simply having dreams of one day having an extremely expository wife. <laughs> <laughs> How did you feel about the uh, the presentation of the Fremen? Otherwise, I really want to defer <laughs> this question. I don't know if you guys. So I think there's a there's a great um, a great article uh, which I would oh, I just put in the show notes by a person I mentioned earlier, Harris Durrani, called "The Muslimness of Dune," um, which is a really close reading, specifically of um, the appendix that goes into the religion of Dune in the in the novel, right? The one of the bits bolted onto the end, um, and um, it's it's a really interesting article but the, the the very short and probably insufficient summary i'll give of it is that there is a bunch of there's there are obvious orientalist issues with this novel however frank herbert very diligently did a lot of reading it doesn't mean that his conclusions from that reading or the kind of creative choices he makes are always perfect or don't have their own issues that come with their own baggage however herbert was really invested and said this many times in interviews of like um you know, he was very interested in in the the sort of T. Lawrence story from the other perspective, from the Arab perspective specifically, or from a Muslim perspective. He was very interested in the deep relationship between Western culture and Islam, and and stretching that forward into the future in his own way. Um, 
and um and all of that you know there's you know like all of that kind of gestures at the sort of i think some of the things that are really unusual and compelling about dune is a sci-fi setting which is that it is our culture in ten thousand years and there's tons of its ideas that are drawn from that and in the, i actually wasn't aware of this quote but um i came out came to it through this um article but it's it's a quote by kind of um john spate who's one of the writers on the film who um sort of um kind of dismissed um and this is i'm borrowing harris Durrani's language here but kind of dismissed the the book's um presentation of you know um like um north african middle eastern culture as sort of uh like costumery basically like exoticism and costumery and there's certainly a, a huge aspect of that um and therefore said it would be inappropriate for the film to go anywhere near that and therefore they made different decisions um and there's a there's a um and the conclusion that is arrived at which i agree with i think is that actually that's not the correct approach the fact that there were no um as far as uh, the horizon when no um sort of middle east and north african experts involved in the making of the film at all and the decision instead was made to sort of um um I guess other the Fremen in different ways would be the only way I would describe it. Seems like an active, um, well, you call it kicking the can down the road earlier. I think it's, I think it's, is, I think it's more accurately called like cowardice, to be honest. Like, I think, I think that, I think it fails to engage with so much that is challenging and interesting about Dune, the novel, particularly when it comes to the depiction of the Fremen. Um, that it ends up with nothing to say and instead a whole bunch of quite uncomfortable touchstones that it couldn't get rid of left in its place. And I think a lot of that is located in the use of language. Like it's really pointed that the film avoids the word jihad, yeah, right? Of course. Which they, occurs all like of the time. They have to. Yeah. Like how, uh, like, for, for a film from that, from a, a big studio, like given the word, the meaning that word has taken on in Western context, uh, how, why would, almost like why would they take that? on uh, and how well, this they is the... sufficiently deal with it in the space of a two and a half hour film so well this is the thing this is why i talk about bravery right like there's mm. a there's a quote i just found it the quote in this um so this is a quote that i'm taking from the, the harris Durrani essay that is but nonetheless is from john spates who's the um he said um he said that basically the use of muslimness in in dune for exotic purpose this is the quote doesn't work today now that, and this is the quote, Islam is part of our world. And the the line from Harris Durrani, which I think is brutal and completely fair, is it's not clear whose world Spates meant, mm. nor at the time at which Muslims, in his view, became part of it. Um, like that, you know, this film has been made of the, exactly the, the kind of the concerns that you raised, Tom. But the thing that strikes me is that, like, you know, Frank Herbert had an academic and a personal and a philosophical and an aesthetic and a you know, Orientalist and all of these different interests, but a very deep interest in in many forms of faith when he wrote the novel, including Islam. And in fact, said in interviews that he wanted to use that part, he was told to make it less Muslim. And he said no, and he, he wanted to use it to kind of make a point, however kind of successfully or not, about the very significant role that um, Islam plays in, in Western culture and, and always has. Um, um and I feel like what that represents as a to a film being made in 2021 is that you go, okay, well, this white American dude in 1965 teed up a bunch of stuff. The people who should take that and do something interesting with it are going to be like, um, you know, um, not just not just Muslim actually, given the the the, the film's broader interest in. North Africa and the Middle East generally, but like you get people from that culture and creators from that culture to bring these ideas back into pop culture um, using the opportunity set up by Frank Herbert and through this, you know, novel that is now a cornerstone of Western sci-fi as an, as the, the kind of the, that is the opportunity. That's what gets it made. That's what gets it through Hollywood. And I think the, the fact that instead you have a um, non-expert team feeling like they have to avoid those sensitivities completely just feels like a tremendous missing of the point to me or a tre certainly a tremendous missing of the opportunity yeah i i think it's um 
the, the cowardice so the, there's there's a kind of mechanical cowardice this i agree with is that um so we're trying to create a transparent culture that boils down the mechanical relationship between these cult these these cultural imbalances between the great houses and this indigenous culture is ultimately ends up being used as a stepping stone for the journey of one cool white dude um that is the that's the nasty uh, the kind of structural underpinning of the story and mm. th th then so if you start attaching uh, modern cultures to that even as in a far flung future um in a you know a derived interpretation of what those how those cultures might manifest how the power dynamics between those cultures that exist now might ultimately end up loads of sci-fi is really interested in this and it's one that kind of always creates um alternate histories in in the far-flung future where we, we could be slightly detached from our current world but still imagine how these cultures might operate uh and kind of compete and interact in uh, a different perhaps fairer context but i think like in june that that's so so loaded <laughs> the current moment that I, I, I it couldn't be made any other way i don't think like it, it would have to be so so different like you'd, I think you'd have to make a thing, different though. story like you, mm. uh, but but i agree what what we what we're left with is is the skeletal the skeletal structure of imperialism um with pretend culture hanging off it that gestures at existing cultures and that is deeply unsatisfying um and ultimately even though it appears to have some sort of substance or something to say about the the world we live in now it absolutely cannot commit in any way to any direction, which which is why I don't have much faith that the Fremen are going to get a good showing the rest of this series, because the the Fremen in June don't don't get to do much. They get to have cool toys that the the houses use, and that the hero that emerges from those houses, even you know a great rebellious one in some ways, uh, ultimately uses as a tool and it's another again it's just another form of just mining spice right it's just, it, here's a resource that <laughs> this guy's discovered um and uh, i think there's the, june the book i think is rescued in some ways by uh an a, a amazing intermingling of spirituality with politics and science that makes that seem like um paul's journey isn't purely about uh exploiting a local population to get over his dad's death um and that there's actually right. something greater going on but i don't i think that's probably too more more weight than a film series even a long one could bear but i don't know i think i think i think one know. of the one of the reasons of the the one of the false dichotomies i think and it's the one of the reasons that it's too late for the can in some ways that it's been kicked down the road is that one of the really crucial things about dune is it's like the it's you know the the influence of the various faiths and, and, and real world um, modern day or historical philosophies or religions that inform it is not limited to the Fremen. It's actually imbued in all of it. And the Orange Catholic Bible in the, in the novel, mm. which is the kind of religious text of the Imperium, has a huge, huge, huge Muslim influence. And so, and crucially, one of the big kind of points in the book is that what the Fremen believe is the same faith as as the the great houses that are arriving. It's just they they have a, an older connection to it. They have you know a different um, pathway through it, um, and you know there are certain so, so loads of moments where, like Jessica's understanding of Bene Gesserit tradition and this notion that they seed prophecy is troubled by the fact that actually it might be that Fremen beliefs predate that, and you know and that sort of loss of control. But crucially, like the the thing that has been missed, I think, is that. Um, you know, and, and it makes me hope that when the when the emperor, when the Padishah emperor finally shows up, that it has the influences that are, that are apparent from the, the novel. That the fact that you know the 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 template for the Imperium is not the kind of Christian God Emperor that we get from subsequent things inspired by Dune, like Warhammer. Um, it's specifically more like an Ottoman Emperor. Mm -hmm. um, and you know the the sort of and yeah, there's there's a ton of you know the Orientalist issues in that, but nonetheless, like that's something that I think the film. Um, steers away from quite dramatically. In fact, actually, on the subject of the emperor, like I thought it was really interesting that the Sardukar, uh, the emperor's kind of space marines, basically, yeah. um, were presented with some pretty striking Christian imagery. Um, the fact that you know in the in the book they're they're basically just the the extracted from a prison planet um, to kick ass like Vin Diesel. 
Um, um, but they also like operate in disguise as Harkonnens, right? They wear the same armor as the Harkonnens. Yeah. They are kind of like, it's a secret that they're on Arrakis. Um, and in this, they come from um, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> the planet of the the the, the basso wobble voiced kind of um, chanting man, um, where people are crucified, <laughs> where people are crucified and bled upside down in the rain, so that this mm. um, army of white armored soldiers can be daubed in blood, which crucially gives them this like red and white kind of traditional kind of Christian crusader coloring. Um, so that they can be sent to the to the desert world, which I thought was like there were just certainly like a ton of fucking choices made one after another with the side of car, and I don't really know what any of them mean, but I went through that whole. It's like the the language they speak, which you know, um, um, but it but not just the way they speak, but the fact that like they apparently can't speak without like reverb and bass turned up to fucking fourteen, you know what I mean, like, um. Like we've come from the subwoofer world to fuck the shock troops. They can't the shock troops. They can't, have, they can't be singing. Oh, oh, I said I was just about to say that. Oh, they can't sing it. Their enemies are beautiful falsetto voices. But actually, wouldn't that be kind of weird? <laughs> cool. That, that, that. No. Okay. We, we've we've certainly described many aspects of a bad Juno adaptation here. But this is the thing, right? Gurney Halleck, right? We haven't played the fucking Ballas set yet. <laughs> runs onto the Atreides airfield, bunch of Sardaukar descend, and they're like, oh, <laughs> and he, he plays a power chord in his ballast set, and it's a big old, big old musical number. Big old you should have a hurdy gurdy. Yeah, the hurdy gurdy. Gurney's hurdy gurdy. <laughs> <Gurney. laughs> well, if it, I don't know if the series, I mean, did it, hang on, does it, hang on, does sound become a weapon in, weapon in what? Hey, you've got to have those what? deep voices on the uh, Sardaukar so that when Paul gets his amazing sonic devices that you know the voice mm. becomes uh, yeah as, as something fierce you gotta eat then the <laughs> and hey film four the subwoofer is gonna be exploding from, yeah uh, it's just a big bassy worm <laughs> <laughs> um does that no i'm not gonna get that's too deep a cut that is too deep a cut but do you guys remember the the parody gi <laughs> joe psas from like the noughties they were like really big on like new grounds or whatever, where someone just dubbed the old GI Joe "Hey kids, don't step on electrical cables" thing. Do you remember that? Nope. Do you remember, do you remember nope. when the baseball coach burps for a full minute? That is what the Sardaukar sound like. Someone will get that reference. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah. Where were we? The Fremen. Marsh, how do you how do you feel about it? I appreciate. It. I just went off on a. a oh, big I mean. Uh, uh... I'm glad you unpacked that rather than <laughs> rather than uh, leaving it to me to burble about it. But I, I do agree. I think the I, I mean, I didn't really know that it said anything uh, about them. I'm, I'm surprised actually to hear that one of the writers thought they'd backed away from um, sort of you know uh, Orientalist othering uh, because I I I don't I mean clearly there's r- racial coding going on with who they've cast to be Fremen versus who they've cast to be Atreides. Or, or, or Harkonnen, but I don't know what any of that means, if anything. It feels like you say a bit of an abdication of saying anything. But I, uh, the Fremen are always going to be really difficult for any adaptation of Dune because I, it's it's a really I mean one of the reasons it's an interesting book is that it's incredibly difficult and problematic with it's the way it deals with religion and and race and ultimately the fremen are uh, like a at least at least partially arab coded people who are subordinated by prophecy by a white savior prophecy and uh are you know innately at risk of unleashing extraordinarily bloodletting across the universe which you can't help but read as being some sort of moral failing on the part of them as a people um and I don't know how you you kind of back away from that uh, in a film adaptation. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. But this film hasn't made a step in any direction. I wouldn't say. No, there Norway. are things I like. Like I liked, I liked that you see. Although it was only clear to me this is what it was doing the second time because it doesn't tell you who it is. But I like that you see like this vision of an alternate future where Jamis and Paul become friends, and Jamis well, is the one who. Yeah, I mean that's surely um uh what's his, his is it Babs Babs Olusan Moken? 
as Jamis, who is an actor I really like, but clearly that was his tryout tape for the role of Stilgar. And they just thought, <laughs> that was too good. We can't throw that away. <laughs> right. But it was like, I liked that as a way of like um, helping that moment have some, you know, have some kind of um, depth to it. And also to give Paul different ways in to, you know, what he means to the Fremen and what they mean to him. Um, then um, we've had a knife fight and that settles it, which is one of Dune's issues. <laughs> then like that, maybe a lot of things come down to that. Um, I do wonder if they will, um, um, they will keep the name of the father of one of the two children Paul is about to adopt. Um, because it tickles me to no end that there is a Fremen whose name is simply Jeff, spelt like Jeff. <laughs> Um, and if they don't keep that the same, I feel like that is cowardice. That is another act of cowardice. Um, it was really like, yeah, I'm fascinated by it. Cause there's, there's like, I feel like, um, that's why I keep wanting there to have been more input from, you know, um, creators from those cultures is, is so that the things that, you know, are that the, the book struggles with in terms of appropriation, I feel like there's a, you know, the book does far more work than than far than most um, to to have something to say about the things that it is adapting and and the language that it is using. However, you know, I kind of want those things to be kind of regranted meaning in in twenty twenty one rather than simply avoided. And like, there are moments like it's really interesting to me watching the movie and thinking about you know, you see the desert mouse several times, right? And um and paul kind of takes a liking to it oh look there's a cute there's a cute mouse here look at how this this delicate thing manages to survive in the desert he sees it again when they emerge from the the sand tent and they you know and there's this and like it feels like you know the just it's leading to the point that he becomes muadib right like that's what muadib means the desert mouse and yeah it's sort of the the fact the film doesn't say that at all means you have this image this space of symbolism set up and never paid off and i wonder exactly when it is going to if that makes sense like um and i found myself appreciating those little moments in the movie thinking oh that's kind of clever they're kind of leading to something and then it's very surprising to me when it does it and i was just just thinking about it then that like you know um if you're going to start making that the kind of um paul's entrance into that world feel a little bit more and start setting up a little bit better. The last scene of the film shouldn't be Paul seeing a cool worm and saying desert power. And then, you know, kind of um, whatever. It should be him seeing the mouse again and him saying, what's that mouse called? <laughs> and Charlie <laughs> turning back to him and saying, Muad'Dib. And then that's, you know, that's, that, that, is that better? It might be worse. But the point is like that sort <laughs> of like the, the, the notion that it's like that ending moment, which I keep coming back to be more of a kind of, indication of a kind of integration or an exchange of ideas and values rather than what it is which is this completely meaningless this is just the beginning like she's taking him into a car dealership and encouraging him not to buy the first one he's seen <laughs> like <laughs> this is only the beginning of your relationship with these mice she should have said <laughs> exactly you'll find um, out much more about these mice in the subsequent sequels to this film yeah exactly this is only the beginning of things you're going to see or do with a worm. You're going to drink a worm. You're going to ride a worm. That's, that's it. That's the two. Um, <laughs> well, I just realized earlier, I was trying to joke about um, weirdy modules, but actually I think that's the film, the Lynch film, uh, a thing the Lynch film just completely invented. Are, is, are they, Chris, you've read it recently. Is that, are they in the book? The weirdy modules? What, what, which, which bit? Uh, the, um, there's devices that uh, Paul equips the Fremen with where they use the voice. Essentially, they speak into them and it becomes a weapon that cuts through that, enemy soldiers. That doesn't happen in the book, at least in the first book. Cool. That might be That's in there. Thing. You guys seen the Lynch film? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, just think, but not for years. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's in there. That's a very literal interpretation of... It's pretty, yeah, yeah. incredibly productive. He's, he's, he's also the dragonborn. Um. <laughs> yeah, they literally fussed with our pillars. Like it's, a bit, it's it's pretty embarrassing part. I mean, it's not a great film. There are parts of it I like, but it's a terrible film. Actually. Yeah, it's one of the worst bits. Anyway. 
The, uh, I think one of the things I'm left with is that, like, Dune isn't unadaptable, which is its reputation for a long time, right? I think this kind of proves it, you know, in a big way. And I think the fact that we can spend a couple of hours talking about its struggles and adaptation, things it leaves on the table, proves that, like, A, I think there's value in adapting this novel, and B, like, I mean, Marsh, you said that this is, like, the best version we're going to get through Hollywood. I guess I partly don't think that it is. Um... But maybe it is. But more pointedly, I think like it comes so close. I think to um, being quite successful, even though as far as away as it is in some ways, that like to me it gestures at like better adaptations that could be made. I don't think they ever will be. But yeah, why do you think um, this film has been remade? Why why has June kind of stayed in popular consciousness so long that it has? Um, has a reputation that it can be adapted for so much money and investment, etc. Hmm, that's an interesting question. I mean, obviously, it's it's like the again, you kind of look back at the advertising, right? Like this is being marketed as like Star Wars meets Lord of the Rings meets Game of Thrones, and one of the reasons for that is because it's a big story um, that has been very influential. Two of those things. Um, I do feel like. And I do feel like, actually, that this film gets quite close to articulating the case for Dune as its own thing, not as proto-Star Wars, not as proto-Game of Thrones. Um, and I think all of my frustrations with it can be boiled down to keep going, keep going with that effort to dig out the things that are interesting about Dune, whether that is its ideas, whether that's its use of philosophy or religion, whether that's its technology. Um and all the things you were talking about earlier in terms of like the amazing visuals. And like, I kind of want to say again, that like, I think it is a very rich setting and I think film at the moment loves rich settings. Um, and uh, not that it ever really didn't, but I think we're in an era now where we can do a lot in terms of really bringing a, a setting like this to life, which would have I mean, certainly the issue that Lynch had in many ways. Mm. Um, and it is such a great showcase for the world building power of cinema at the moment. Um, like I said it earlier, but I wanted to say it again, like the costumes in this film are fucking amazing. Like I kept I, the second viewing was for me was basically like clothes, the film, right? Like the, the way everything kind of looks and feels there's so much, there's so much importance based on people getting dressed in Dune anyway, and you know, putting, taking things on and off um, in a, in a, in a very kind of dune way it doesn't get horny till later um uh, the um i thought all of that was really kind of just lush and, and and kind of amazing and i can really understand why people go see it and find themselves really kind of transported by it because i think it's deeply successful in, in all of those ways um and i don't know if there's actually a lot of properties out there or books waiting to be adapted that necessarily offer themselves up for that in quite the same way whose cultures are as rich and as different and as interesting as dunes are like thinking about things like the current adaptation of foundation that's going on like asimov doesn't give you a ton to work with when it comes to like a, you know some sort of striking singular visual image that will make you buy a cinema ticket whereas Herbert's got that big, big worm. Oh, there's, there's still Rama, though. There's still a good Rama film to be made, I'm sure. There is. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree. I think, like, the, um, one of the things I really loved about the sort of visual interpretation of a lot of the technology is how fiercely, well, most of the time, pragmatic it is, especially with in the armor design. Um, stuff like, even beyond the still suits, like the, the Sada car, they could have been in, like, mega power armor or something. But... They, it looked like that's the sort of thing you probably would wear on a desert planet with uh, these kind of faceless screens that would probably preserve mm. an atmosphere that your fighters are familiar with. Um, I, I, and like they, they resisted the urge to kind of go proper, like um, cool, traditional power technology that looks really big, massive, you know, uh, huge swords that, that yeah. they all still fight with small knives because that's how the technology works and that's how people actually do combat um and perhaps uh, uh, i absolutely love the ornithopters um uh, mm. because for me 
either when you actually see them and how small the wings are and how fast they move actually you think i thought um well that's actually possibly the least believable thing about the whole film but it is how exactly how i imagined them in the book like they yeah. sound and look and move like attack helicopters with wings and when they break and when they dive bomb that that it, all those yeah. moments are incredible when they happen the the, 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 the dive bomb moments in the uh, the siege and in uh, the worm attack on the harvester, just so so cool. <laughs> Moments of sudden adrenaline when they happen, perfectly realised, and uh, so much like design and like concept art and technology goes into producing those scenes in a way that I just could they even have done that ten years ago? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, well, it's interesting thinking about it. If you reverse engineer it, right, the film is super successful because of its love of devices and technology, and you know, you know. I think we're all people who have at some point or another gotten a bit sweaty looking at a picture of a fucking space truck. You know what I mean? <laughs> and if you've got that, if you've got that instinct in you, then it's, 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 it's basically, you know, pornography. It's a must watch. It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, with the, if you like a space truck, the, the, the horny parts of June start very early uh, in this film. Um, like to the like the 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 guild the spacing guild transporter which is like this enormous worm mm. in its own right right that like great kind of column hanging in space fucking love that shit um yeah. a lot but it's interesting because that that interest in like you know space mega structures and technology and lived technology and grounded technology is is a huge motivating force of star wars and to take star wars as an example for a moment star wars is in some ways the example of what happens when Dune gets successfully passed through a Hollywood model. You know, George Lucas was deeply in, 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 interested in devices and going fast and all of that sense of momentum and, and vehicles and speed and that comes across in Star Wars and it's partly from his own interest in cars and partly from his interest in World War II dogfighting movies and partly from Dune. Um, uh, and then at the same time, all of the things that are hard to explain or complicated or sensitive about Dune when they arrive in Star Wars, um, get made so much simpler and more accessible for our benefit, like um, the Bene Gesserit becoming the Jedi um, from a, an order of like galactic fate manipulating space Jesuits to um, uh, your cool granddad and his magic voice. Um, like, you know, the fact that the very first force thing you see obi-wan do in you know the first thing that lucas came up with for the jedi was the jedi yell which is the thing he does to shout when he scares off the sand people and then the second thing you see him do is use the voice basically like all of those influences as they get kind of like kind of some sort of rendered down into a much more consumable form of pop culture it's sort of really successful and obviously i love star wars and i don't think a lot is lost and i really like what that stuff then goes on and becomes but there is a great sense with Dune that I think the film captures of returning to the kind of loftier, slightly more ambitious domain from which a lot of that stuff originally came. And I think that's maybe one of the reasons that the film feels fresh to people now is because we've grown up with the stuff that drew a lot from this. And to see it in its grown up form in some ways is, is really satisfying. And I, I think the film is successful at bringing that out. And I think a lot of its affectations as filmmaking are successful at bringing that out because they convince you that you are watching something with depth, um, even if it sometimes is simply just loud. I feel like we've, we've, we've all kind of wandered quite a big way into the um, causal pathways of the hot take sphere here. Um, I'm trying to think how to land this thing. <laughs> Do we just give up and let it kind of float to the top of the storm and crash? <laughs> or do we attempt attempt to kind of bring this home? Ah, power back our wings. Let the uh, let fate take us where it may. Indeed. Move irregularly as we smash into the ground and are devoured. Um Yeah. I kinda of, having talked about it for like an hour now, and I am sorry for going on. I now kinda of want to see it again. Or maybe just read the next book or something. Mm. I, I I want to see it again. I think I'll watch yeah. anything that is is trying to be June, <laughs> and this yeah. right. tried to be right. June more successfully than I think anything that's been committed to screen. Um, and I think it's, it's a sci-fi spectacle in its own right. Even though I I think ultimately I feel there's some cool dramatic stuff that has been left on the floor. Yeah. 
I am glad it exists and it's cool and a little bit weird to see this deeply nerdy book get the attention it's now getting. But like I just said, I think that's my kind of my feeling like I think it's deserved and I think this is going to be the the limpest centrist take I'll ever have. I think <laughs> for the film's failings, I'm glad it's raising the conversations that it's raising because I think Dune actually bears that level of scrutiny and mm has something to offer if done appropriately. And for all of the kind of, oh, you could have done this stuff of different ways to adapt this text, like nothing's going to be perfect. And if the film is successful at getting people reading that book and thinking about it, then that's great. And I will I will very happily go see the a second half of this. And I'm very, very interested to see how they handle it, even if I suspect it's going to be one rad as hell sandworm attack scene attached to a film because there's no there's no wilder bit of like a declaration of frank herbert's interest i think than the great climactic sandworm attack being a paragraph (laughs) in the novel um (laughs) i'll say one thing i i did miss the princess irulan and her many books a prolific publishing spree. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, a friend and I concluded that, that if you really modernize um, the Princess Ireland, she would have a podcast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> she's kind of the Richard Littlejohn of that universe. She's just like <laughs> controversial column every single. Pretending to be. I mean, the thing is, she doesn't write controversial columns. So this is, you know, she just sort of. She's telling it how it is. <laughs> she just describes they're relatable. The relatable takes. She's yeah, gone exactly. TikTok. Mm. <laughs> no, I think I think I think the Princess Ireland would be it's more like she's got some great recipes for like spice crisps or whatever. But like all internet recipe blogs, you need to read like a four thousand word <laughs> personal story before you get to the recipe. So so it is like, you know, my you know, well um <laughs> my father viewed Duke Later Atreides in this way. And this really prefaces his understanding of the Muad'Dib in many different ways. Anyway, you don't want to overdo it with the spice. Um, otherwise, you get that popping feeling in your mouth. You want to just oh, no. like, sprinkle a little bit on the Pringles. That's my final opinion. I, I hope she, I hope, I'm hope. i interested to see how they handle that. And I actually, I did miss her presence from, because one of the things I really like about the book is that sort of being in two places at once with regards to time, feeling like you're reading a history book as it's happening. I can understand the reasons for making something far more immediate than that. Um, but I'm looking forward to seeing what happens when the film, as zoomed out as it feels, zooms out even further and kind of contextualizes this stuff in in the kind of the scope of the broader kind of historical moment that it's ultimately going to be part of, right? Because I think the film so- does and doesn't give you a sense of how much Paul realizes what a kind of, um, I think you described it once, Tom, as like, what? the magnitude of the table flip he is going to achieve. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to see how they portray the Emperor and, and that whole, his whole structure of the, the, the court he holds and stuff like that, they, which they, they're going to have to show at some point, even if he only fleets yeah. when he shows up, just the design decisions they're going to make around that is going to be fascinating. Yeah, and there's a ton of interesting casting decisions to come as well, like Alia is going to be a really interesting character to get right. Who plays Fade? Who plays Fade? Mm. Who does play That's Fade? That's one for That's one for our listeners. In the, in the yeah. Discord, in the comments. Dreamcasting, yeah. Dreamcast your fade, Rauther. It needs to be a young actor with a, a, a like a Chalamet equivalent level of poise or like presence um, and ideally cheekbone. Uh, but then it can... will end up being Chris Pratt. <laughs> so <laughs> no. <laughs> we will have to be sad about that eventually. <laughs> oh, no. no, Chris Pratt is going to play Leto too. Um <laughs> I, I'm gonna I'm gonna just I'm gonna say Ansel Elgort. Kieran Culkin. Mm. Kieran Culkin. He'd be good. Uh, I, I want to see him do a proper full heel turn. He's great in succession, but I think he, if he what if he goes full psychopath? Mm. Mm. I think that's all of the Dune thoughts we've got for now, following our long meander through the desert. Um Obviously, the lock-ins like this are, are one-offs um, that are not a, a paid part of the Crate and Crowbar Patreon. Um, that falls to the regular episodes, the next one of which will be next week. If you'd like to find out more about supporting the podcast, however, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash Crate and Crowbar. 
Otherwise, the regular links are YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Create and Crowbar, and Discord, link which is on our website at createandcrowbar.com. We would love to hear your spice taste thoughts. I genuinely would, um, even though we are right. Uh, if <laughs> uh, Is there any other links we normally do? I can't remember. It doesn't really matter. There'll be another lock-in in two weeks. Who knows what that will be about? Probably not Dune, unless. Uh, in the meantime, I have been Chris Thurston. I've been Tom Senior. I've been Marsh Davis. Thanks for listening, everybody. You can say it with me if you like. No! <laughs> Let's say it in the voice of infinite old women stretching back in some time. <laughs> <laughs> or as Sadukar. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs>